Welcome back to Monday Musings, a casual conversation about culture and theology. I'm Justin Ely. And I'm Daniel Chen. We're just a couple guys talking about some stuff. We are trying to keep you entertained on July 4th. Happy July 4th, everybody. Yeah, I mean, what else are you doing? There's not much that goes on, right? Yeah, you're, you're out of the lake, you're grilling some burgers, and you're listening to Monday Musings. Yeah, before the fireworks. You were worried when you woke up today thinking... I, it's probably a day off for them. Am I going to get my podcast? I I have to get it today. Yes. The answer is yes. You are. You're yeah. going to get it today. Yeah. How would you live a joy joy filled life without us? Yeah. Yeah. Impossible. We're actually recording this live. Literally, <laughs> this very moment, we're coming to you. <laughs> that is not true at all. We have pre-recorded this because we are also taking today off. Absolutely. So thank you, America. Uh, we're talking about Christian clubs. Today, we're going to be talking about Pentecostal and charismatic traditions. Get your snakes ready. Get your snakes ready and pull out your flag and get ready to (laughs) run around. It's going to be good. But before we get there, we start with the restaurant of the month. Daniel, what you got? So my restaurant of the month is a restaurant called Eating Americana. It's off of Peachtree Parkway if you live in this area, in the Alpharetta Johns Creek area. Norcross, Peachtree Corners. It's technically Peachtree Corners, I think. Mm -hmm. And it is, if you like food that's cooked by a man who was born in Hong Kong, who moved to New York to be a fashion designer, decided to be a chef, so learned in New Orleans, and moved to Georgia to make delicious non Chinese food, American food, this is the place for you. Bingo. And I will say there, it's a cool place. Uh, it's it's definitely kind of like a hole-in-the-wall type place. Uh, the waiter told me that he believed that it they had the best burger in Atlanta, which is a, bis, a big claim. Now, I'm a smash burger, so, like, when you talk to me about food, I can't just, like, burger's too broad for me. There's, like, different mm, kinds of burgers. Sure. So... I'm a smash burger guy. And so if you know, like smash burger is like, you know, most of the best burgers in Atlanta, if you go to like, like Bacado, like that's more of a smash burger. It's a thinner burger. Okay. Uh, this is more of a thick burger. I would say this is probably the best thick burger in Atlanta for sure. That there you I, go. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's really good. I, I haven't tried a lot on the menu, but the burgers were good. The uh, we had a fried chicken sandwich that was really good. I'm looking forward someday to trying some of their plates. They have Cajun pasta and stuff like that. And uh, but yeah, apparently their big seller that you should go try is their lobster mac and cheese. Mm, I do love me some good lobster mac and cheese. Yeah, so something for you to try. But yeah, if you live in the area, you know, go try it out. If you don't live in the area, find yourself like a local place like this that no one's heard of. I and, like it. And go eat there. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Mine, and I've done this before, but i got to do it again, Table in Maine. I yeah. love Table in Maine, downtown Roswell. Best fried chicken, some say in the state, <laughs> some say in the world. You know? I mean, it's their fried chicken really is amazing. Um, I still need to try it. I don't know what I've been doing. Love Table in Maine. Great, just good southern food it's funny when you when you go eat do you head more towards roswell or alpharetta we always go to alpharetta like downtown alpharetta i tend to go toward roswell that's funny but you know now now that i'm moving to you know john's creek that i'm better than you and i know it city (laughs) uh i don't know now that i won't be a roswell resident maybe because i'm so close to downtown roswell i can actually like go under 400 to like get to downtown roswell wait so how do you get there from like is it connect like you go down we go down martin's road so you go through your neighborhood yeah and or you can we can go down holcomb too but we go down martin's road to riverside and riverside road goes like underneath 400 and then we like loop around okay yeah that's interesting it's funny like you don't live that far from me but to even do that seems like so much further than what i do yeah it's it's like a different world yeah now that i'm like thinking about where we're moving it's funny because it's only like 10 minutes from our house but it, everything's going to be like different. Yeah. But but we get to stay with the same Kroger, which makes Hillary very happy. <laughs> this was like a important part for her. Which one is yours? Well, we we had been going to the Centennial okay. Kroger, but once COVID happened, they started doing the like, um, they'd bring your groceries out to you. <clears throat> you know, I forgot yeah. what that's called. Whatever. Curbside pickup. Curbside. Or whatever, yeah. yeah. And. Sorry, Centennial Kroger, but they didn't do a great job. And the one on Old Alabama, Hillary liked better. Oh, so she well, she permanently it's because changed. That one is in Johns Creek. Well, exactly. <laughs> the I'm better than you, and I know it's city. So we're really excited to join this. I'm better than you, and I know it's city. 
I mean, literally, that Johns Creek's motto actually is "Be the exception," which oh, is really, which is very fitting of Johns <laughs> Creek. So excited. But uh, and if you're listening and you don't live around here, Johns Creek is like one of the wealthiest cities in America. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it, like top twenty I, or something. I, I think yeah, maybe like even top ten. More, or something. Yeah, I yeah. mean it's yeah it's it's pretty crazy. The uh, Tyler per- Perry used to have like this giant mansion. Yeah. in Johns Creek, and he sold it, and they, they made, made a l- whole neighborhood out. They of made it. like fifty houses out of yeah. his one house. <laughs> they made fifty houses that start in like the nine hundreds out of his one house that also had like a partial golf course on it. Yeah. <laughs> that hosted Barack Obama for like a fundraiser when he ran for reelection. So yep. that's Johns Creek. Johns yeah. Creek. There you go. So let's talk about Pentecostals in light of uh, Johns Creek. I don't know how many Pentecostals there are in Johns Creek, but there's gotta be some. There's gotta be some. Yeah. So we're talking about Christian clubs. We've been talking about different Christian denominations and today we're going to kind of uh, lump in the denominations that would be a part of the kind of Pentecostal and charismatic traditions. So again, we're using Trevin Wax's quick guide to Christian denominations on the Gospel Coalition. We'll post that on um, our show notes. But as far as the name goes, the term Pentecostal comes from the coming of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost. And charismatic comes from the Greek word charisma, which means gift and often talks about the gifts of the Spirit. So when you're thinking about Pentecostals and charismatics, typically— they're going to be people that really emphasize the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yep. And usually tongues, prophecy, healing, usually the more miraculous sounding ones. Yeah. And I do think it's interesting. I always I always say this, like, uh, how come the PCA only has the gifts of, like, teaching and discernment, <laughs> right. and the Charismatics only have tongues and prophecy? Seems like we're <laughs> splitting up here in right. unnecessary ways. So as far as the history goes, I mean, you can trace it back to— Well, I, I, sorry, one more thought I was yeah. just, uh, on that. If you've met any Charismatics, like, they actively, like, try to practice their gifts. Like, I remember, like, when I, my yes. time at KSU, I would walk down, and there would be a guy who'd be like, I'm practicing my prophecy. Can I prophesy on you? I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I was a part of the Wesley Foundation at Georgia when I was a student there, and they were— they were Methodist, but as we'll see in a minute, charismatic denominations actually come from the Methodist movement. Mm. Uh, so th- there's some relationship there. But they were very charismatic, and man, you just felt bad for anyone in a wheelchair or crutches that happened Ooh. to be close to the Wesley Foundation on Wednesday nights at eight o'clock because <laughs> you didn't stand a chance of making it through unprayed for. Was that uh, that word "stand" purposefully used? <laughs> Was the word what? The people in wheelchairs and stuff, they didn't stand a chance. I didn't oh, know if you no, were. shoot. <laughs> yeah, they did not stand I didn't know if you were trying to be funny. A chance. I, I was not, but it would have been nice if I was. Maybe I just have the messed yeah. up brain, yeah. No, it, it's true. So, But as far as the history goes, they, they do trace their um, movements back to, like, the Wesleyan holiness tradition, the higher life movements, um, modern Pentecostalism, a, a couple revivals associated with it was one at Bethel Bible College in Topeka, Kansas in the early 1900s, and then another at Azusa Street, a mission in Los Angeles. And you hear about the Azusa Street revival. uh, That's where that comes from. There was also um, a revival at Asbury, uh, which is a Wesleyan seminary, I think back in the 1980s. And, I mean, that revival was marked by people in chapel literally started just confessing sin. Hmm. And it just nonstop, and a, a prayer movement broke out. But uh, Azusa Street Bethel Bible College, huh. uh, part That's of the, really cool. kind of the yeah, yeah. Um, so, what is church like in a Pentecostal or Charismatic church? It depends on how far you are on the spectrum. <laughs> um, there, I mean, you're going to have singing, preaching, baptism, Lord's Supper, offerings, but you will probably have time for, like, giving of prophecies. Uh, you'll have time for sp- speaking in tongues and interpretation. And again, like, it, it is unfair to paint all charismatic or Pentecostals in one. For sure. 
I mean, th there's going to be. But let's do it anyway. No, let's do it anyway. <laughs> I mean, on one side, you're, you are going to have some crazy backwoods snake handling <laughs> people. I mean, that that is what it is, you know. And then on the other side, like, I remember Hillary and I attended uh, Mount Perrin Church of God years ago. And um, it was a very meaningful and orderly but charismatic worship service. Huh. I mean, the, the worship was incredible, and uh, there were probably more— nationalities represented at Mount Perrin than I'd ever seen in a church I'd gone to. Cool. Which I think is one thing you, you will often see about charismatic churches. They do tend to be more diverse um, because, I mean, different internationals, the charismatic movement tends to be strong in Africa, Asia, yeah. I mean, different places, uh, South America. Um, someone started speaking in tongues from the balcony. The senior pastor stopped everything. I mean, and there were two or three thousand people in the service that that we attended. He stopped everything. He interpreted it, and he invited people down to the altar to pray. And you know, like a typical like Baptist or Presbyterian church, you invite people down to the altar, like no one comes. It's just awkward. You're all singing a song, looking at the pastor standing up front, like waiting for people to come. Freaking a third of the congregation rushed the front and just came down to the altar and started praying. It was like 20-minute prayer time unplanned. <laughs> so it was very orderly, very meaningful. So you, you have the whole spectrum uh, yeah. on charismatic uh, churches, but you're going to have a lot of emphasis on tongues, a lot of emphasis on prophecy. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think it's interesting because— uh, you know, whether you're a cessationist or you're a continuationist or whatever, or charismatic, hmm. like, uh, have you met, have you ever talked to charismatic of what they would say about what Paul says about, like, not doing those things to disrupt worship? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, s some people that, that I have heard at least would, like, distinguish between like speaking in tongues and praying in tongues interesting and some people would say as long as i'm kind of quietly in my corner praying in tongues it's not a disruption mm. and i say that to the guy next to you uh, <laughs> it's very disrupting to him but that, that's the kind of distinction i've heard gotcha yeah i, I didn't know either i was just curious yeah. um but i think you know the ones that I, the worship nights or whatever I've been to more recently, you know, in the past 10 years that were more charismatic. I think what you'll see that's different than like, <laughs> like a reformed Baptist church like ours or PCA church is mm -hmm. like, you know, they're the opposite of frozen chosen. Oh yeah. They're, um, they're the unfrozen freely choose. <laughs> freely choose. <laughs> but I mean like, there's like dancing and yeah. there's, like, people shaking oh, and yeah. like, um, and they're long. The yes. song. So a lot of the popular songs are, are written by charismatics, right? Yep. Um, and they're longer. It's more trance-like, a lot of their music. Um, and But I, I remember hearing, it's funny, some Georgia Tech students, you know, Georgia Tech students are as straight-laced as you could be, you know? Yep. And it was like, yeah, I showed up this church service, and they were like, the worship was two hours long before they did anything else. Right. And they're like, we don't have time for this. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> but that's what you get. Sometimes you go to a worship night. Yep. If the spirit leads you to, you're there for five hours. Oh, for sure. You know what I mean? And I, so. H Hillary makes fun of me because she says that I make it sound like it happened more often than it did. But when we were part of the Wesley Foundation, I felt like it was like every other week that the sermon was canceled and we just kept singing. Right. She's like, it wasn't that often. But but regularly, it was like, we feel like the Lord's doing something right now in this, so we're just going to keep singing, and I'm, I'm not going to preach the sermon I had planned. And, I mean, that's very typical in more charismatic Man. circles is like, you know. You think I, you could ever pull that off if you forget to pray <laughs> prayer or something? I had a busy week. I just feel, you know. <laughs> um, so as far as polity goes, usually they're more congregationally driven. Um, they'll associate with other like-minded churches, um, but they can adapt to the polity, the denomination that they're in. I, and I will say, I, I feel like uh, this is anecdotal, but I feel like it's the charismatics that kind of preach that unity message the most. That's probably true. Um, that is probably it, true. Of like unity, unifying the churches, yeah. unity. And, and we go back to um, 
like, uh, you know, that family friends function paradigm Mm -hmm. where it's like, we're all family, brothers and sisters in Christ, but we don't need to like, and we can be friends, but we don't need to function the same. But I feel like it's the charismatics that I've known that are try to unify on all three levels, including function the most. Sure. um, That I find interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, so even the, co- that's the a great cooperative point. Fe- fellowship idea is like yep. very, it's very cooperative. We're all in this together. Let's join hands. That's yeah. probably true. Uh, a few distinctives. So they do tend to be more Arminian uh, because a lot of Pentecostals were birthed out of the Wesleyan tradition. Yep. But, and th- this is breaking like centuries of like what it means to be reformed. In, in kind of our like, the new Calvinist or the young restless and reform, the like sovereign grace church yeah. movement, which is who wrote 80% of the songs we sing at our church. They are a charismatic, uh, reformed Calvinistic church. group. Yeah. They're both John Piper, probably the most well-known like Calvinist in among American like millennials since 1998. or Yeah. Whatever, yeah. Uh, is, is a charismatic himself. Like he encourages people to operate all the gifts of the spirit. Hmm. Um, And for, I mean, for centuries, uh, Calvinists had been cessationist. Um, You know, Tim Keller has joked about like, yeah, when people say like, God told me like, yeah, Presbyterians don't say that. Like we don't hear God talking. We just read the Bible, you know? (laughs) Right. Um, But so you do have like, I mean, there is, there is a, Calvinistic charismatic group, but there it's is. it's more predominant in in uh, Wesleyan kind of settings. Um, like I mentioned before, due to the rise in the global South, um, it's very ethnically diverse. And, yeah, I mean Pentecostalism really is taking off uh, all over the world, but especially South America, Africa, Asia. Um, I do think it kind of makes sense because uh, you know. I, there's a there's a quote in a movie called Unusual Suspects where the main character says the greatest lie the devil ever told was uh, that he didn't exist, mm. and I think that's true in America, right? In like yep. first world countries and like super developed countries, there's no need for almost like the like spiritual realm in some ways, right? Because mm-hmm. we convince ourselves very easily that God yep. doesn't exist because we're so smart and all that stuff. Yep. And I think where you see more of like the demonic activity and stuff is in these, like I think we talked about in, in Africa is it's like, you know, you talk about spiritual things like, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, like, sure. Um, and so it also makes sense to me because of that. Yes. That the charismatic movement makes more sense to, yep. to, catch fire in those places as well because there's so much of like the non-physical realm that they have interacted with if that makes sense yeah for sure uh, that makes a lot of sense to me it does make sense yeah um a a distinctive like pentecostal doctrine is the baptism of the holy spirit right which occurs after conversion right so like what we would say is to be converted to Christ is to be baptized in the spirit. So when you become a Christian, you are baptized in the Holy spirit. You become regenerate and born again. Yeah. The the spirit, it makes you new. Yeah. Yeah. A, a Pentecostal would say, no, 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 no. Yes. You're regenerated. Yes. You've become a Christian, but there's a second filling that needs to happen. A second baptism where the spirit really comes on you in power and it's evidenced by speaking in tongues. Mm. That's going to be a pretty common thing. Um, which is the unfortunate effect of that is it does create kind of a um, caste system within Christianity, the yeah. haves and the have-nots. And, I mean, I was told in college by a, a Pentecostal friend of mine that, I mean, basically, if I just loved God more, I'd speak in tongues. Um, and I'll, I just need to ask him. Yeah. Which, which can be really, like, hurtful <laughs> if you— you do and you don't you don't get it and you think there's something wrong with you yeah and you, when taken too far with that that's how you get health wealth like the prosperity gospel yes and where it's like if if you just had more faith god would have healed you yes i'm like man that's a horrible thing to say to yep. someone dying of cancer, cancer. yeah, yeah. 
Like, yeah. Um, yeah. And so th- th- I feel like that that's a danger to, to, yep. to avoid there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think what we've seen in a lot of these denominations is that there is a healthy way to um, express and experience your doctrine. And right. then there's an unhealthy extreme that that can lead to something pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and I think within those, you know, I feel like every denomination, every church we've talked about has people who are truly believers. Sure. And some that are not. Yeah. And I think what you see is the one of the reasons that denominations in itself is not bad is because you see a, a bigger picture of the body of Christ. Sure. W- amongst the believers. Yeah. But you also see that in every denomination, you have people who take it to the extremes. Yep. That make it so far past what it means to be a Christian that there's bad elements to all of them too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're going to emphasize, like we said, gifts of the Spirit, all the miraculous gifts, healing, speaking in tongues, prophecy have continued. Um, in general, they downplay reason and tradition while focusing on Scripture and experience. Um, and related to that, I'd say kind of related to the experience piece, I would say most Charismatic and Pentecostals tend to be egalitarian mm-hmm. in their view of like gender roles yep. of like women in leadership in the church. And one of the things you'll often hear said is like, well, who am I to tell a woman who's been gifted that she can't be a pastor or that she can't uh, preach in the church? Um, and, and you're hearing the experience piece, mm. right? Who am I to say she's had this experience? Who am I to tell her no? Um, that's when you interpret that, kind of boil that down, that's the emphasis on experience yeah. that the, the Pentecostals and Charismatics are going to bring to the table. Yeah, it's interesting. It's not that they don't believe the Bible or study the Bible, It's but it's not like, like if you come go to a, any Reformed church, it's like, that's it. That's the, like you get all your truth from the Bible. That's sure. it. Like, sure. Um, and maybe almost like, and I'm afraid to say this, but like too much like where you don't like, sometimes you can quench the spirit you know, in that way. Yeah. But the charismatics like are on the complete opposite and where it's like, you should probably read your Bible a little more and right. focus a little less on like, <laughs> sure. What quote unquote God told you, yep. you know, like, yep. um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think the, like the, it, it's interesting that our strengths often can be our weaknesses, right? You know, like I think reformed churches, their strength is, the Bible. Bible. Yeah. And that can become their weakness because they can uh, make out the Trinity to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. You <laughs> right. Know? Um, but on the same time, like, uh, I-, I think charismatic churches, their, their strength is their, like, hey, the God is the same God that he was 2,000 years ago, and he's powerful, and he's mighty, and he can do great things, and, um, and, and he, like, to— become a Christian and to live as a Christian is an experiential, like we experience God's spirit and blessing. That's, I think that's a benefit and it can become a weakness if you take it too far, you know? Yeah. So absolutely. Definitely worth um, considering all the famous figures that Trevin Wax list. I don't know any of them. I don't know. Except for one of them, Gordon Fee, who's written some good commentaries. That's it. That's all I know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, related groups, so you're going to have Assemblies of God is going to be the largest Pentecostal denomination globally. Um, I did not know this. Church of God in Christ is a historically black denomination within Pentecostalism. But you also have the Church of God, which my great uncle was like a district superintendent of the Church of God. Huh. Actually, he might have been the treasurer of the whole denomination. So my grandfather grew up Church of God. So a lot of this, I mentioned this in the very beginning of our series, a lot of this like Pentecostal stuff, um, I grew up hearing stories from my aunt and my mom about their grandmother, my great-grandmother, going to church with her in a Church of God charismatic church growing up. Yeah, interesting. So I, a lot of these remind me of my childhood sometimes when— Some of the stuff is talked about. United Pentecostal Church International, um, the Calvary Chapel movement started by Chuck Smith. uh, That's kind of broadly charismatic. 
and associated with the rise of the Jesus movement, a lot of people like our parents' age came to faith in the Jesus movement Mm. in the like 70s, uh, kind of charismatic-ish, revivalistic. um, So, yeah, I mean, stereotypes. I think we've thrown a lot of them out there, but I would say this. I feel like the stereotype is the people who are involved in these churches have like what I would call a camp counselor yes. personality. <laughs> they probably wear chacos. They probably wear chacos. There's like super. They're always super excited, very happy, and like bouncing around and high energy. It's like if you're like a seven on the enneagram, you're probably like more likely to be a Pentecostal, or if you're a Pentecostal, right. you're more likely to be a seven. Yes. Maybe that's a better way to say yes. it. Yes, uh, you like. It's like everything's got to be happy all the time. <laughs> um, at least those that who I know, like that's that's how it is. It's right. like, it's like, oh, this is a lot of energy. <laughs> that's like what I. The you know, I, I'll tell you. So it, when when you're thinking of like, um, like charismatic d- groups, like I think one of the more disturbing is like Bethel. And like they're like a movement, right? Um, I think Bethel's pretty concerning on a number of like theological fronts, like and the grave sitting and stuff. Yeah, there's just some weird things the gold I've dust heard in about. The vents. Yeah, yeah. I also think it was ironic that during the like COVID lockdowns early on, they like shut down their healing service because of the sp- spread of COVID. <laughs> and I was like, hey, could we just could we just take a step back here for a second and? kind of analyze what exactly you're communicating here yeah um so bethel i mean they tend to be known because their music they just crank out yeah really popular songs Uh, but on the other end you have someone like mark mark rutland who actually speaks now at um jensen franklin's what what is it his church uh i I know i i'm blanking jensen franklin's church I love Mark Rutland. You can listen to him on Victory 91.5, The Rock That Holds, Not The Rock That Rolls. Uh, <laughs> For real? They used to be. I think they've gotten rid of that slogan. But, oh, I mean, as man, of, like, a couple like, years ago. And then they go, like, Jesus. I'm like, yeah, man, great radio station here. But But Mark Rutland would be on most weekdays at, like, noon. He's a He's a... Pentecostal charismatic guy actually was in the Methodist church. I believe he was my pastor, Steve Woods pastor growing up. Oh, okay. And then he left the Methodist church and became more charismatic, but he's a great Bible loving. I mean, I disagree with him on a lot of theological stuff, but uh, I, I admire and respect him a lot. So you have the whole spectrum, David Cooper at, um, uh, Mount Perrin church of God. Great great preacher um yeah so whole spectrum but you you like you said if you go to africa or south america asia you are much more likely to see the influences of pentecostalism than even here in the united states yeah for sure but so there you go there's our thoughts on pentecostal and charismatic traditions the next podcast is going to be our last one in the series and we're going to call it other <laughs> the, so, the others the, uh, the the others yeah you know if you watch lost you yeah. know about the others so yeah so our apologies in advance for the denominations we will lump into others but that's we're going to end on a bang with yeah. the others <laughs> so join us when we talk about it until then have a good one